Um, welcome everybody. This is uh, Sandeep Agarwal. I'm a clinical cardiologist at the University of Calgary Cummings School of Medicine. And welcome to the third in the series of hef -PEF talks. Um, this one is a deep dive into the treatments of hef -PEF and amyloidosis. So we're doing both hef -PEF treatment and amyloidosis. And I'd like to thank our sponsors for this three-part series, which is Novartis, AstraZeneca, and Pfizer. Um, now, I would ask everybody who has uh, joined us live to please sign into the link. It should be in your chat window. And at the end, there will be an evaluation that we'll also put in the chat window if you could also fill out your evaluation. Uh, just a reminder for everybody to keep their mic on mute and enter any questions that you have into the chat window. Um, so I'm just going to stop share for a second and just introduce our speakers who um, you can see in the, the video there. Um, I'll start with uh, Dr. Howlett, who will do the first presentation. Uh, Dr. Howlett graduated from the University of Toronto Medical School in 1989 and is clinical professor of medicine at the Libin Cardiovascular Institute Cummings School of Medicine, University of Calgary, and practices an advanced heart failure and has been heavily involved in the clinical practice guidelines in the generation and knowledge translation in acute and chronic heart failure, as well as clinical investigation. He is the former president of the Canadian Heart Failure Society, Canadian Cardiovascular Society Heart Failure Guidelines Chair, and currently chairs the annual Canadian Heart Failure Society Update, which I try to attend every year. I'll also introduce Dr. Fine at the beginning, just to move things right along. Dr. Fine is a heart failure cardiologist and an echocardiologist in Calgary, and he's an associate clinical professor of cardiac sciences uh, and medicine at, and community health sciences at the Cummings School of Medicine, University of Calgary. He's a clinical director of the Living Cardiovascular Institute, and he's the director of the clinical and research core echocardiographic laboratories and co-leads a heart failure research program. Dr. Fine has a clinical and research interest in heart failure and specifically in infiltrative cardiomyopathies, particularly cardiac amyloidosis and anderson fabry disease. And he's the co-director of the amyloidosis program in Calgary and Car cardiac amyloidosis clinic. He's the co-principal investigator for the Canadian registry for, the, for amyloidosis research and um, is one of the co-writers of the amyloidosis uh, guidelines from Canada. So we'll start off with Dr. Howlett. Dr. Howlett is gonna to talk to us about the treatment for HEFPEF. And I think Jonathan, you're still on mute. There, you can hear me now. Yes. And uh, I'm just, uh... I'm just trying to get this put in the right spot so I can, there we go. Okay, can you can you hear me and see? Yeah, we can see you. You're not in presenter mode if that's what you wanted, I'm not sure. Uh, so what are you, are you, you're not seeing that? Oh, it's your slides plus the other slides on the side. Okay, so um, it says Zoom quit unexpectedly. So I'm not sure what's going on here. Um, Oh, there we go. So I'm going to, so I'll stop sharing and, and start sharing again. Um, okay, let's try this one more time. Uh, where are we here? Is that okay there now? Yep, it's the same, but. Um, yeah, all we see is the, we see your slide and we uh -huh. see the other slides along the left-hand side. Uh, okay, well, I don't understand what's going on. So sorry about that. Um, let's just get through this here. The, uh, those are my, uh, those are, so it's big enough for you to see, is that right? Because to yeah. me, it's, I'm, I'm seeing a full screen, no? Uh, yeah, we're not, it doesn't, look, it doesn't say that you're in presenter mode, but that's fine. If you, you might have to switch screens. So if you go into your presenter, and you switch screens, uh, you can do that. Yeah. Uh, it's, so the left, it's, the left is on the right and the right. Can you, can, is Noel on? <laughs> if Noel is on, maybe Noel should start, 
Um, I don't know if that's possible or not because it uh, something's going wrong with Zoom. Every time I'm trying to share, it starts to quit. Yeah, no problem. Noel, I'm happy for you to get started. Are you okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. no problem. That'd be great. Okay, uh, I'm going to sign out and then sign back in again and, and, yeah, see, and see if I can get it to work. Okay. And just Sorry. just just email me your slides to uh, my email. I'll send you the link, and uh, and that way, if they're having any problems, I can always show the slides. So yeah, no. Why don't you get started? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So uh, is this the right mode or is this the wrong? That is mode? correct. Yep, you're good. That's the good, the good. I'm good to go. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Well, thanks, um, Sandy, for the introduction, and and thanks again to uh, AstraZeneca, Novartis, and Pfizer for sponsoring. Uh, yeah, I'm going to give an update uh, on therapy. So last session we talked about diagnosis. So I'm going to talk about uh, what's new in the world of uh, treatment for cardiac amyloidosis. So here are my disclosures. So for our objectives, we're gonna focus on transthyretin or ATTR uh, amyloidosis for tonight's talk. Uh, there's actually a lot going on in the world of AL or light chain amyloidosis and different chemotherapy regimens, but as cardiovascular clinicians, those are not really ours to prescribe. We're kind of in a consultative uh, background mode for those patients. Um, but we're the we're for primary prescribers for ATTR therapies, and so we'll focus on that tonight. Um, I'll talk about approaches to monitoring and surveillance. Uh, still very much a, a question mark for a lot of different um, aspects of this, and we'll we'll touch on that as well as some other knowledge gaps regarding the use of ATTR therapy. And we'll take a look into the future and see what's what's coming with regards to new indications for approved therapies. Uh, and other therapies that are in development uh, at this time. So just by way of review, just in case um, you didn't uh, make it to the, the last talk or, or, or transthyretin amyloidosis is a bit of a new area, um, this is the pathologic cascade uh, for transthyretin amyloidosis. So transthyretin or TTR is a transport protein made mostly in the liver. Um, it's made as a four subunit um, tetramer, uh, and the key step in the disease process is when that tetramer um, dissociates into monomers and dimers and, and fragments, which uh, then aggregate together to form fibrils, which get lodged in the tissues, primarily the heart and the nervous system, uh, to cause disease. And there's two subtypes to ATTR. There's the hereditary type, which is uh, relatively rare uh, in Canada, makes up about maybe 10% or even less of our cardiac amyloidosis clinic uh, ATTR population. Um, and that's a, a TTR gene mutation. Uh, it's more common in, in certain racial and ethnic groups, um, uh, and it, um, it can cause a mix of cardiac and neuropathy symptoms. And the wild type, which is an age-related disorder, uh, occurs in the absence of a gene mutation. We're not sure why it really occurs. Um, but it's far more common in Canada and North America um, and uh, has a bit of a male predominance, um, but that is lessening over time as we find more and more patients with this disease. And so for hereditary type, uh, there's well over 100 gene mutations uh, that have been identified, although about three or four are relatively more common in Canada. It's autosomal dominant transmission with variable clinical penetrance. Uh, and as you see here, most patients have a mix uh, of cardiac and neurologic symptoms, although typically one of those symptoms or systems predominates over the other. But certainly in the majority of our patients, we see involvement of both sy systems. Uh, and then there's the wild type, which is predominantly a cardiomyopathy, um, although has a little blue triangle there uh, and has a little bit of neurologic involvement in some patients. And we're learning more about that as we go as well. Okay, so uh, when it comes to therapies, just taking another look at that uh, figure uh, demonstrating the disease cascade and, and where the different therapies work and how they work. Um, liver transplant, you see at the top there, that used to be a treatment for uh, only the hereditary type to stop the production of the mutant protein. That's really going away um, and only a few centers are left that do it. Um, and it's largely being overtaken by the medical therapies uh, that you see at the bottom there. Uh, so the first blue box on the left that are TTR gene silencers, uh, inotersin and patisseran. 
They're both injectable agents, one's IV, the other subcutaneous. Uh, and currently they're only approved to treat patients with the hereditary or genetic form of ATTR for polyneuropathy. So at the moment, they're only approved as neurology drugs, uh, essentially. Uh, and the way they work is they reduce hepatic production of the TTR protein. So they basically uh, gum up gene transcription uh, and reduce uh, TTR production levels dramatically. And it turns out actually you don't need uh, as much TTR as we make to live, um, but they do need to supplement uh, vitamin A, uh, which is one of the key features of, or, or functions of, of a TTR, uh, of sort of the TTR protein. Um, so yeah, at the moment, these are neuropathy drugs. And then the one beside it uh, is tefamidus. Uh, and tefamidus uh, is an oral medication. It's taken once a day. Uh, and what it does is it binds to the TTR tetramer or the, the four subunit protein and stabilizes it so that it does not dissociate and continues on doing what it was meant to do and does not cause buildup of any further amyloid uh, deposits. And so uh, all of these therapies uh, essentially work in a similar way to attenuate disease progression and stop the disease progression um, from, from moving any farther uh, and to uh, stabilize the patient's symptoms. Whoops. Um, and tefamidus, I should mention, is approved for both subtypes, uh, the hereditary type and the wild type. Uh, and it's only approved for the, in Canada uh, for the treatment of cardiomyopathy. So this is the drug as, as cardiovascular care providers that uh, we are able to prescribe at this time. So just a little bit more about tefamidus. Uh, so uh, what you see on the right there is the Kaplan-Meier curve from the ATTRACT trial, which was the pivotal trial that demonstrated that tefamidus works. And that was published uh, in 2018. Uh, the primary endpoint was all-cause mortality and cardiovascular hospitalizations, but I'm just showing you the all-cause mortality Kaplan-Meier curve here. And as you see, you know, the patients with uh, on tefamidus had a better survival, uh, and the curves diverged in about 18 months, um, which reflects that, you know, the disease progresses slowly, and, and the therapy to treat it uh, has, um, I wouldn't say a delayed onset effect, but does take some time for the effect to be uh, evident, um, which is um, worthwhile considering when you're looking at uh, candidates for tefamidus. Uh, tefamidus is a very easy drug to use. It's once a day dosing. Uh, there's really no side effects. Uh, it's approved for patients with class one to class three heart failure symptoms uh, of either subtype, as you mentioned. Although in sub-study analysis, uh, patients who had lower NYHA class one or two tended to derive the greatest benefit from tefamidus, uh, which is a, a trait that's common in infiltrative disorders. The earlier you stop the disease, of course, uh, the more effective uh, the treatment is going to be. The main thing to keep in mind with tefamidus is, as with the other therapies, it doesn't really improve symptoms. It's not designed that way. And so you have to do manage, you have to manage patient expectations and let them know that um, the odds that they're going to feel better are low. And if they do begin to feel better, uh, it's probably not going to be for several months. And really, the goal is to keep them uh, in a stable state, uh, similar to they are when they start the medication. Now, I just mentioned this almost as a, as a side note, um, because this is, is now going away mostly across Canada, fortunately. But when Defaminus was first approved by Health Canada and the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technology was uh, recommending reimbursement, public reimbursement uh, conditions. Uh, they basically went word for word for what the uh, inclusion criteria for the ATTRACT study was, which uh, at the time that the ATTRACT study uh, began enrolling included uh, amyloid biopsy um, evidence uh, through uh, any tissue, whether it's the heart uh, or the salivary gland or the fat or elsewhere. So patients need to have biopsy evidence of amyloid deposits uh, somewhere. Uh, and so this made its way into the criteria, even though the development of PYP or nuclear scintigraphy scanning really became the predominant uh, guideline recommended way for uh, confirming ATTR and diagnosing ATTR cardiomyopathy. 
So this left us in an awkward position where we had to pursue tissue biopsy confirmation in patients who we've already made the diagnosis with in order to uh, get patients uh, to have public coverage, um, which in some patients was a bit of a challenge and in some patients was actually quite risky. Um, so fortunately, uh, we and others in different provinces were able to advocate uh, that there's been a, a new development uh, or advancement uh, to uh, change the standard of care for diagnosis. Uh, and us in Alberta, we were able to change this. Uh, Alberta Blue Cross and Alberta Health uh, listened to this, fortunately, and actually subsequently CADIP has now changed this as well. So most of the provinces have followed suit, not all of them, but we're hoping that in the next few months that uh, this, this criteria will be a thing of the past. And that's just uh, yeah, the saying that we no longer require this fortunately in Alberta. Now, just a quick word about the silencers that I mentioned earlier, um, uh, dinatursin and patisserin. Uh, these uh, trials demonstrated very similar findings that Patients on placebo had progression of their neuropathy. Remember, these were neuropathy trials. Um, whereas patients on medication uh, had attenuation or even a, a little bit of an improvement in their symptoms uh, for those on patisserin. And they both, both trials used a very similar um, neuropathy index. Um, like I said, at the time, as of, as of now, these are for polyneuropathy uh, and only for hereditary, so not for the wild type. Um, but that may change in the future, as I'll show you in, in just a few minutes. So these medications uh, came about and became available and approved right around the same time, uh, which was really quite a, a remarkable development. So we went from having no treatment to having a number of treatments, um, you know, with specific indications, albeit, but still a number of approved treatments for ATTR. Uh, and so, of course, we began to use them, but we still are learning a lot about how patients respond to these medications and what populations to, that uh, they work best in. Um, and I've just listed some of the knowledge gaps that have opened up uh, in the field since uh, these medications have been approved. So uh, one of the immediate ones was uh, for hereditary patients with both cardiac and neurology or neuropathy symptoms. As I mentioned, most patients have both, although often one system dominates over the other. And I think most clinics, including ours uh, and most programs, have, just have been going by which system is the predominant one to choose which agent they use. So if they have mostly uh, neuropathy, uh, then they get put on one of the silencers. And if they have mostly cardiomyopathy, then they get put on to famitis. Now that can be... Uh, uh, dynamic over time and can change, uh, which is kind of an interesting thing that we're seeing in our patients, you know, which system is, is, is predominant. Um, and sometimes, most of the time, it's easy to, to figure out which system is the worst uh, or most effective, but in some patients, it can actually be a challenge if they have significant involvement with both. A few other knowledge gaps worth mentioning. So um, monitoring uh, of disease. Now, this is not really well defined. I'm going to show you some uh, recommendations from different publications, although they're largely expert opinion based rather than uh, evidence based. Um, but certainly we've when we've had to struggle with this question in our clinic, as I know, uh, every clinic that uses medications and follows patients has, uh, which is what type of testing to do? How often do you do it? And then what do you do with the results once you have them? You know, how do you define treatment success? How do you define treatment failure? Should you consider ever changing therapy if you have the option to change therapies? And then what do you do about carriers, asymptomatic carriers of hereditary ATTR who don't qualify for therapy because they don't have symptoms of disease, uh, but how often do you monitor them? How do you monitor them um, when you're trying to determine whether, you know, whether they meet indications for therapy later on in life? So lots of question marks, uh, and um, we're hopefully going to answer these in the coming years. Uh, oops, sorry. Okay, so here's one of those uh, publications I just mentioned that uh, has a recommendation for how to monitor patients with ATTR cardiomyopathy on therapy. Uh, so they suggest every six months, uh, and this is from the European Society of Cardiology, every six months do an ECG uh, lab tests with NT-proBNP and troponin. Uh, 
uh, neurology assessment, six minute walk test and, and KCCQ quality of life. And then annually do cardiac imaging, a Holter and an ophthalmology evaluation for patients with the hereditary type. So this is a recommendation. Our, our lab doesn't, uh, or our clinic, I should say, doesn't do this. Uh, we, we um, uh, of course, use these tests and what we end up doing is something different. And to be honest, you know, when I, when I ask around different cardiac amyloidosis clinics, I think most people do something similar, but not identical to this. Um, but this is uh, one recommendation that's been published. And in fact, the authors of, of that uh, publication uh, went on to define disease progression. Uh, so not just recommend monitoring, but also provide a criteria for disease, defining disease progression of ATTR cardiomyopathy. And what they said was that you should uh, uh, examine three different domains, so clinical and functional, laboratory and imaging or ECG, and that you need um, a marker from each one of those domains to uh, qualify as having uh, disease progression. And so, for example, you need to have a change in your NYHA class and a rise in your NT-pro BNP, and then an increase in your wall thickness or some other combination of the different markers that you see here. I'm not gonna go through them all. Um, I think this is uh, interesting. You know, I don't know that this is being actively used by a lot of programs. We don't measure, while we, while we track our patients, we don't necessarily go by this criteria to define disease progression. The other important part is that once you have a definition of disease progression and you've decided that it's getting worse, what do you do about that, right? Particularly for ATTR cardiomyopathy patients who at the moment only have one drug that's approved uh, for use. Um, and that's, that's also a question that um, uh, will change as, as the field evolves and we get likely more therapies available to us, which I'll talk about in a minute as well. Here's another monitoring sch uh, schema, uh, which I actually like a bit better than the last one I showed you. Um, and it, it has a, a simpler way of defining ATTR disease progression. And in fact, this one is not cardiac specific, but applies to uh, both neuropathy and cardiomyopathy and is, is very clinical. Uh, and they, this group defines ATTR disease progression as one of the following things. Either there's a worsening of several symptoms, signs, or test some combination of, of markers that are worsening, or there's appearance of a brand new symptom that wasn't there before, or there's worsening of a single sign or symptom that's causing some degree of functional impairment, whether it's cardiac or neurology or neuropathy. Uh, and then the last one is, is a series of, of clinical scenarios that are very specific to ATTR. So I like this one because it's simple, it's, it's very clinical, um, and it's easy to remember, um, but it also still begs the question about what do you do with the information once you've decided that a patient is, is progressing on therapy, uh, and neither of the two articles that I just mentioned uh, talk, talk about that at all, um, and uh, that's, an, again, an area that still needs to be uh, further uh, researched and better understood. Um, so yeah, a number of gaps uh, in, our, in our knowledge uh, and in how we manage these patients. Uh, and I think I've mentioned most of these here. Um, combination therapy, so using a silencer and um, a stabilizer has been considered and in, in, in many, well, I shouldn't say many, in a number of, of centers and clinics in the United States in particular, dependent on a patient's uh, drug coverage, they can actually get coverage for both. Um, and whether that's a good idea and whether it, it, it makes a big difference or not is, is uncertain. Um, but it's an area that we need more, more data in, uh, and all of these areas we need more data in to, to guide us better uh, in how we're managing our patients. Um, just a couple uh, comments here about the current indications for the therapies um, and also their overall impact on disease. And so I mentioned that the silencers are used for neuropathy and tefaminous is used for cardiomyopathy, but in fact, we know that there, of course, there's benefit for the other systems for both therapies. Um, and why wouldn't there be? Because they're both very upstream therapies. They're not targeted specifically at an organ. Uh, they're targeted uh, at the disease process. And so on the left there, you see some 
uh, secondary analyses uh, or substudy analyses from the Apollo study, which looked at patisseran for neuropathy, they looked at patients who they had suspected cardiomyopathy based on their echoes, not confirmed, but, uh, but suspected based on having increased wall thickness. Uh, and they found that um, cardiovascular hospitalizations and mortality were lower uh, in the patients uh, on patisseran. Very small numbers, but still there was a trend towards benefit. Similarly, about 10 years ago, there was a, a, a randomized controlled trial looking at tefaminis for neuropathy, and this was done in Europe. Um, and it was a negative study. Uh, it didn't quite meet p-value significance as you see there uh, on the middle or the left bar, um, but there certainly was a trend towards improvement uh, or better results and attenuation of neuropathy in patients on tefaminis. Uh, compared with placebo, and in fact, Defaminus has been used in Europe for many years for hereditary uh, ATTR polyneuropathy, although uh, not approved in Canada or, or in the US. And so just goes to illustrate how, you know, these are disease uh, modifying treatments, not necessarily organ specific treatments. Uh, however, um, we do have very specific indications that we need to keep in mind. Um, but this landscape is likely changing significantly in the next few years as there's a number of clinical trials uh, that are ongoing and agents that are in various stages of development. So TTR silencers that are being studied uh, in a cardiomyopathy, uh, iplontersin is a next generation uh, uh, inotersin. Uh, Patisseran, actually that study has been, um, the results have been released, although not yet published, and I'll show you that in just a minute. Utriceran is next generation patisseran. Uh, there is a new TTR stabilizer, acaramidus, that's being studied. Uh, and just this year, we've had very exciting results on the potential for CRISPR technology and gene editing for patients with hereditary ATTR. And then also amyloid degraders, particularly uh, PX, PRX004, which will get a new name uh, and is being examined now in ATTR. Uh, to potentially help with uh, tissue burden um, and, uh, and, and inhibit amyloid fibro formation. So lots going on, uh, and I think the future is going to look very different than our current uh, therapeutic landscape. So just in the last couple of minutes here, uh, a, a couple um, more uh, slides on newer developments. Uh, and so the ATTRACT study looking at Tefamidus was 30 months, um, but what happens after 30 months, right? Uh, so this uh, is an ex a publication looking at the long-term uh, extension study of the ATTRACT, which went out to 60 months. Uh, and what the study did was for patients who were uh, on Tefamidus in the ATTRACT style, uh, ATTRACT study, they stayed on Tefamidus. Um, and for patients who were on placebo, they were initially randomized to either 80 milligrams or 20 milligrams, the two doses of tefaminus that were studied in the trial. However, in, in 2018, all patients actually transitioned to the new formulation of tefaminus, which is 61 milligrams, and their follow up and followed up uh, on that out to 60 months. And what this slide shows is that, as you would expect, the patients who were at, when they were entering the long-term extension study, the patients who were on placebo in the ATTRACT trial were worse off than those who had been on tefaminus. They were worse off with regards to six-minute walk test. They were worse off with regards to quality of life and NT-pro BNP. And they were, of course, a sicker population because they had been treated with, with placebo over the previous um, you know, 20, 20 or 30 months, pardon me. And here's the end point of, of this uh, study. Uh, you see in red here, you see um, that uh, the patients who continued on to feminist and were on to feminist right from the beginning. Uh, in blue, you see the patients who started out on placebo in the ATTRACT trial and then were switched to defaminus. And then you see at the bottom, you see an extrapolated curve, uh, hypothetically, if those patients had remained on no therapy at all. And the key point here is that for the both the, placebo, both the placebo and the tefaminus, but particularly the placebo arm, you see a flattening out of their, out of their mortality. Um, and that suggests that those patients actually do benefit, even though they're sicker and have more advanced disease, they do benefit from uh, being treated with tefaminus, even though their disease is at a later stage. So that gives us some information about uh, indications and, and how we prescribe the therapy and what to expect.
uh, after they, they go on therapy, even for those who are uh, sicker. And then this is uh, my last slide here. Uh, so this is uh, data that was just released actually in September uh, at the International Society for Amyloidosis meeting uh, that was held in Germany this year. So this is the Apollo B study, which uh, uh, looked at patients who had ATTR cardiomyopathy, both hereditary and wild type, and treating them with patisseran. Uh, and so these patients have very similar uh, characteristics to those in the ATTRAC study in, in the sense that the majority were wild type patients. Um, you know, the NYHA3 was uh, kind of the cutoff um, and uh, some were on to 30% were already on to and it randomized them to patisseran versus placebo for 12 months. And the primary endpoint was six minute walk distance change with a few other secondary endpoints like quality of life, death and hospitalizations. And uh, sorry, this is my, my, that was my second last slide. Uh, this slide shows that indeed the patients who were on patisseran with ATTR cardiomyopathy uh, had uh, a favorable response compared to those who were on placebo. Uh, so those patients, their six minute walk test distance continued to decline. Uh, there you see in purple and in blue are the patients on patisseran uh, who had an attenuated decline uh, of their of their ATTR. So further illustrating that, you know, there is cardiac benefit uh, to the silencers um, and uh, will remain to be seen, you know, whether they get approval and, and how we use these drugs moving forward. Um, and so the bottom line is uh, a lot more to come. So that's my update. So thanks very much for listening. Uh, and if there's any questions or comments, uh, let me know. Thanks, Noel. That was uh, that was great. Um, great review of the treatments and what we're what's coming. We know that there's a lot coming when you have an entire conference dedicated to a particular topic. Um, so uh, you know, having a, an international conference on amyloidosis has a, says a lot about where amyloidosis is likely going. Jonathan did have a question about disease the disease progression criteria. Were these chosen because of the relationship to outcomes? How are they chosen, do you know? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it, it, no is the answer. There was, they were chosen quite arbitrarily and it was kind of a, an expert consensus, if you will, of um, I think about a dozen or so, you know, leading experts in the world on, on ATTR. Uh, and so, yeah, they're, they're kind of, they're very clear. You know, they say that, you know, these are not evidence driven. Uh, these are expert opinion driven. Um, and I think even they say at the end, you know, we need better evidence to help uh, refine these or, or guide our use of them moving forward. Um, so, you know, it's a very valuable exercise. I think it gives us somewhere to start while we wait for more data. Um, but I, I think, you know, probably those, those will evolve further, you know, as that data becomes available. Great. Thanks. Were there any other questions from the audience? If not, we'll move on and well, we'll thank Dr. Fine and we'll, uh, if there's more questions, we can always bring him back if he stays on. Great, thank, thank you. you. Okay, Jonathan's gonna try to present again. Um, so there you go. That's a little better. Are you in presentation mode? I should be, can you see, can you see that? Yeah, it's still not in presentation mode. So, you know, okay, you me... show the slides. It's crashing again. So I don't understand why. It was working earlier today. So, yeah, no not problem. Sure. So, so I'm going to just... stop sharing and, and I'll just ask you to advance slides, okay? Yeah, no problem. So I will share. Just give me a second here because i got to move it into presentation mode. And I was in presentation mode. I'm going to flip too, so the... Okay, can you see? Does that look good? Yeah, that looks nor That's the way it's supposed to look. Perfect. Okay, um, uh, so advance the slide. Uh, thanks, Sandy, for doing that. Um, next. And these are my disclosures. They're also available at uh, ccs.ca uh, as well. Uh, next slide. So we're only going to do a couple of things. Uh, we're going to, it's a bit of an abbreviated uh, talk. Uh, and uh, we'll go into really half PEF. And for the purposes of this talk, it'll be an ejection fraction over 40. Now, 
We talked about diagnosis in the past, and we're not going to do that again. But remember, 40 to 50, uh, 41 to 50, 41 to 49 is uh, mildly reduced. Uh, but I'm going to lump them in uh, because uh, many of these studies, and especially the ones I talk about more recently, did include ejection fractions uh, above 40. Next slide. This is an old slide. Um, it seems like it's only five years, but it's it seems longer. And as you can see on the right side of the pain, there are the the, the the overall mortality is fairly similar. Now, in the past couple of years, uh, some of the long-term registries have shown that mortality isn't quite as high with the higher ejection fractions as the lower ejection fractions. Uh, as you'll see uh, later on, there is a difference in how mortality is dominated, and we'll we'll uh, we'll go through that. Uh, younger people tend to look a little bit differently than older people. Next slide. Now, the problem is there's so much overlap in the way that they present, as we talked before, uh, advance um, that it, you, they all have these symptoms, they all have these signs. The difference is on the right side, it's with the imaging. So we have to measure the ejection fraction. So when, you're, when, you're, when you have a patient in your office or you see them in eMERGE and you don't have the imaging yet, you will, um, you will, uh, you will, you will actually uh, not know what you're dealing with until that's done. Next slide. Now, <clears throat> how are the two conditions related to each other. They both cause the same symptoms and signs. On the left is somebody with, is a heart that has low ejection fraction. And the hallmark really is contractile dysfunction, or as we call loss of contractile dysfunction, usually also loss of myocytes and a dilated heart. Uh, therefore, the ejection fraction falls. On the right, the heart does not typically dilate wall thickness typically is maintained uh, and there's not as much cell loss but there is a greater amount of fibrosis and inflammation next slide so there are a variety of items that may impact and so in the absence of data as to you know large randomized trials that would uh, show therapies that that improve outcomes we were left with treating this uh, from a pathophysiologic and symptomatic perspective. So we would look at the potential contributing factors such as arterial hypertension or iron deficiency or diabetes, and we would try to treat those all the while keeping in mind that we needed to monitor the volume because that's the hallmark of heart flare as we talked about in previous discussions. Next slide. Uh, so on the left are things that aggravate heart failure, volume overload, increased heart rate, atrial fibrillation, cardiac ischemia, uncontrolled diabetes, anemia, and CKD. And uh, we potentially manage them uh, in the green by interventions in the green box. Next slide. I don't know why how that's happening, but it's it's not. There we go. Okay. The problem is that we used a, uh, a, a cookbook approach to treatment of HEF-REF because it seemed that every major class of therapy improved outcomes. ACE inhibitor, ARB, RNA, beta blocker, MRA, and SGLT. But when these, for the most part, when these therapies were evaluated uh, in, the, um, in, the, in patients with HEF-PEF, we had these very, very disappointing results. Next slide. If we look only at the hospitalization portion of the primary endpoint, if you recall, the most common thing to happen in a patient with heart flare was to either die of a cardiovascular death or have a hospitalization. So if you take out the cardiovascular death, which was typically completely unaffected by those therapies, you did see a small signal for a modest reduction in hospitalization. Next slide. And if you do a regression, and this is a little out of focus. I'm going to have another related slide that you'll be able to identify a little bit better in the future. I just wanted you to look at the overall shapes here. So if we look at individual trials, we can see that, that as ejection fraction changes on the x-axis, 
that uh, the uh, hazard ratio of the therapy involved, which is on the y-axis, changes. The two biggest uh, um, uh, or heaviest slope were with the CHARM trial on the far right. And look at the beta blocker trials. It looks like a hockey stick. It's not even a curve. And once you hit the ejection fraction of about 40, beta blockers become essentially useless to outcome management in heart flare, whereas the others generally go up over time and they appear to lose their effect around 50% or highest, uh, higher rather. Next slide. So this is a much better quality slide as you can see here. And if you look at multiple trials, looking at the same agent, so for example, RNA includes both Paradigm and Paragon, and that way you get a much smoother curve. MRA involves more than one uh, 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 spironolactone related therapy, for example, and we have DIG here. They all show the same thing, that at the lower ejection fractions, they tend to exert better effects on outcome, okay? And, uh, on the, uh, and uh, as they go up, they, sent, they tend to lose that. So that's how we've always treated these therapies in the past. And, this, and so we didn't really have a lot of excitement in people with HEF-PEF. Next. So principles, tachycardia, blood pressure control, treatment of comorbidities, diuretics, and exercise training can improve symptoms quality of life and have a trend towards lower hospitalizations. A, B, C, D, E is the uh, algorithm uh, that we have typically teach uh, learners. Next slide. However, uh, we've had in the past couple of years some really important findings. So you may recall that a little over a year ago now, uh, the Emperor Preserve trial was published. And that showed that in a large randomized trial for the very first time, the composite endpoint, which is typical for heart flare, a combination of CV death and heart flare hospitalization, that's what HFH means, was reduced. And if you explode that lower corner, I didn't do that here. If you explode that lower corner, the benefit became apparent within 30 days. It actually acts and it acts quickly. And it's not unlike the curve you saw with half ref. This was very exciting. There were some issues with this trial in that we were never really sure if they had that same curve with respect to higher ejection fractions as we saw with the other therapies. But we did learn some other things. Next slide. And this is around the use of diuretics. I just thought I would add this substudy here to give you some perspective. Typically, 80% of people in any given trial are uh, for half, half PEF or half ref are on diuretics, 20% aren't, and they're on at various doses. So I thought I would show you the diuretic substudy from this trial because it's quite instructive. As you can see, no diuretic from the left going to any dose greater than 40 milligrams a day on the right. The patient profiles are different. They get older. They're uh, uh, more likely to be female. They're sicker. They have worse outcomes. They have uh, higher BNPs. Um, the EF doesn't change. Uh, and the likelihood of being hospitalized goes up dramatically. So it's a higher risk group. So what happens when these patients are treated with empagliflozin? flows? And next slide. Well, the answer is the hazard ratio for outcomes, whether it's the primary endpoint on the top or total hosp uh, hospitalizations on the bottom, no different. In other words, if your patient's on no diuretic, high, diure high dose diuretics or average dose diuretics, the effect of this drug is the same. I thought you'd like to see that. Next slide. Other endpoints such as the change in kidney function slope or EGFR slope uh, by the, the more recent uh, 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 race agnostic CKD EPI that's a, that has replaced other methods for uh, EGFR assessment now, no different according to dose. So there's no interaction kidney-wise, there's no interaction heart player-wise. Next slide. There's also no difference in terms of likelihood of improving uh, quality of life. So the, the, there's a small difference in the average score. There's about a 15 to 20% difference in the likelihood of either getting substantially worse or substantially, substantially better. And it's true whether it's at one year here or another time frame. Next slide. And then finally, if you're on epiglifosin, you're less likely to start diuretics on the left panel. And notice how quickly that happens. It happens within 30 days. And you're also more likely to stop the diuretics. That effect takes a little bit longer 
uh, to manifest, but you're more likely to discontinue diuretics. So there's something going on. It's clear that the heart failure state is improving. Next slide. So that was fine until uh, this year where the DELIVER trial reported at the same ESC meeting. This is a bigger trial. Uh, and in, 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 in two ways, it di differs from AMPA, from AMPA uh, Preserve. One is that it's much bigger trial. Two, it actually includes patients with improved ejection fractions. So these patients had never really been studied in a randomized trial. They were always excluded from the other HEF, HEF, HEF trials. So this was quite exciting. And uh, they're followed up for about the same period of time, a little over two years. Uh, next slide. Uh, and uh, about a third of patients had ejection fractions 40 to 50, a third 50 to 60, and a third over 60. So a great range of ejection fractions. And lo and behold, we see exactly the same thing here as we saw with the Emperor Preserve trial, about a 20% reduction in endpoints, and the curves begin to separate within 30 days. Next slide. We see that whether it's cardiovascular death or worsening heart failure event or just a worsening heart failure event, we see the same thing. The curves change and notice we look at little cuts with the blue dots at different times. So if you look at the data at 30 days, it's significant. If you look at the at two years, it's, it's uh, different. The only thing that changes as time goes by here is the benefit of the drug. The difference is our certainty of the estimated benefit of the drug. That's the only thing that changes as we accrue events, and that's why you keep uh, these studies going. So very early effects of the trial, uh, of, the, of the intervention. Next slide. So what happens with death? We know it reduces hospitalization, but in low ejection fractions, we see that there's a difference in, in mortality. Do we see that in this uh, study? Well, remember, People with lower ejection fractions on the left, their mortality is dominated by sudden death and heart failure death uh, in the uh, teal and uh, brown. On the right, notice that non-cardiovascular death begins to dominate when ejection fraction rises. So if you're giving a cardiac drug, you can't expect it to affect non-cardiovascular death. Therefore, it's much more difficult to show a difference in mortality in these older patients with higher ejection fractions. So that's one of the reasons we've not been able to show that in HEFPEF. Next trial, or next slide. What did we see in the uh, DAPA, HF, and, DAP, and DELIVER trial? So this is all ejection fractions, and we see all-cause death is reduced, heart failure death and sudden death are reduced, unknown and non-CB death are not increased. We're not losing anywhere else in order to gain cardiovascular-wise, and the result is an overall reduction in death. Next slide. If we begin to pool the analysis, we look at, uh, remember those curves that gradually went up above 50%, uh, went up above unity at around 50% ejection fraction. This curve does not. It stays below 1.0 at all ejection fractions. It looks like that these drugs actually, unlike say uh, MRAs or ACE, it looks like these drugs maintain their efficacy at the high ejection fractions, even when it's 60%. Next slide. If we look at first hospitalization uh, or uh, total hospitalization, so the previous slide was included cardiovascular mortality. Here, uh, we're looking just at hospitalizations and it's much flatter and you can see a, a much more obvious reduction at every ejection fraction. Next slide. Finally, what are the results when we look at cardiovascular death? And if you look at the point estimate of cardiovascular death reduction, according to the trial, so the two DAPA trials, DAPA HF, low EF, de deliver, normal, uh, uh, preserved EF, emperor preserved is preserved EF, and emperor reduced is low EF. Soloist is another trial that I won't spend a lot of time on, but they were included because there were a thousand patients in that trial, even though that trial didn't last as long. And what you're seeing is number one, no uh, statistical heterogeneity, that's the p-value of 0.94. That basically means that these point estimates are the same. There's no difference between them statistically. And two, you see that hazard ratio of 0.87 with a p-value of 0.002, that means that these drugs 
reduce uh, cardiovascular mortality, and they do so uh, whether it's a high ejection fraction or a lower ejection fraction. So for the first time, we're seeing a drug that lowers mortality, cardiovascular mortality, in HEF-PEF as well as HEF-REF. Next slide. So a modification of that previous slide, you can see that I had the two top panels hidden. Now they're, uh, they're shown, and we have dapagliflozin and empagliflozin, uh, both showing a benefit at low as well as high ejection fraction. Next slide. The result of these trials uh, is that in the just presented last week at the CCC meeting uh, by Eileen O'Mara, the co-chair, the CCS guidelines for use of, of uh, GLP-1 receptor antagonists and SGLT inhibitors, not for diabetes, for cardiorenal risk reduction. Okay, these are, these are as cardiac and kidney protective agents. Next slide. And their recommendation is that in adults with heart failure and EF over 40 with no upper limit, we recommend the use of SGLT to reduce hospitalization for heart failure. This recommendation came out before dapagliflozin, uh, what I showed you a minute ago, and before the deliver trial, before the meta-analysis. This will likely be re revised uh, in the next iteration. Next slide. So for SGLTs and heart failure, we have HEFREF, which is about half of our population, mildly reduced ejection fraction, which is about one-sixth of our population, and HEFPIF, which is more than a third of our population. And uh, next slide, uh, advanced. And you can see that it's now indicated in Canada for all ejection fractions. Empagliflozin is indicated for all ejection fractions. Dapagliflozin is indicated for HEFREF. I would point out that in Alberta, however, that you can get, uh, you can get dapagliflozin uh, on Blue Cross for heart failure without diabetes. Can't, can't do, you cannot get access to empagliflozin on Blue Cross that way. It has to be diabetes indication. So for non-diabetes, you can, you can fill out the form for dapagliflozin. And fortunately for everybody, there is no place where you need to put the ejection fraction down on that dapagliflozin arm. All you need to do is say that it's uh, say that it's uh, indicated and put in uh, fill out the rest of the form. So that's good news. Next slide. So what do I tell primary care providers now? Well, it used to be that I would say treat the patient in front of you, modify their volume with diuretics if needed be, uh, investigate their heart failure, confirm the diagnosis, and refer because they're need to, they're going to need to be worked up for ischemic heart disease, and it's good to have co-management between specialists and primary care for heart failure. I always told them to wait until you get the ejection fraction before you start adding other therapies. Number one, to get a good baseline. Number two, to see if there's going to be improvement later on. Number three, to look uh, at, uh, especially for the use of MRAs uh, and uh, for the ARNI, and of course, for the, for the beta blocker. However, I've changed what I'm saying to people now. And what I'm saying is, if you strongly suspect heart failure and you really, you, you're confident, I see no reason that unless there's a contraindication that you could use the diuretic as appropriate and also start an SGLT while you're awaiting your echo because it's not gonna matter what the ejection fraction is. It's not gonna matter what dose of diuretic they're on. They're going to have an indication for the SGLT. And then to refer anyway, because they're going to need a workup, further therapies are going to be needed, uh, and, uh, and you can move on. And this is a good way to get early initiation of therapies to be very, very aggressive in, in the management of HEFREF. Uh, now, you say to me, well, what about ARNIs? And I don't have a slide for this. I probably should. As you know, right now, you can get access to them uh, with a uh, ejection fraction less than 40 because it's indicated it's, it is the preferred drug to an ACE or an ARB. We know this, we've talked about it before. I will say this though, uh, even though there's evidence that these drugs are uh, very useful before between 40 and 50, if you go back to that slide and people can have copies of this if they want, you will see that that regression curve for Sucupitril Valsartan is definitely below one between ejection fractions 40 and 50%. It's really around 50 where it starts to lose its efficacy over and above an ACE inhibitor. Uh, 
So when I see somebody who gets an echo result and it's 44 or 45%, then I prefer to look at it as though it was my mother. And if my mother had a report that said an ejection fraction of 44%, I know that based on the normal variability, that there's at least a 20% chance that, that ejection fraction is under 40 and possibly higher than that. I prefer to give my mother the benefit of the doubt and give her access to that drug uh, and when, I'm, when I'm filling out, I'm, I'm very pessimistic and I write down the lower limit of that ejection fraction as opposed to the upper limit of that ejection fraction. That's my preference. It may not be your preference. However, I've, I think it's quite justifiable especially given the data that's involved. Next slide. So here's what we have. We have uh, uh, five uh, classes of treatment, okay? And the larger the font, the more heavily uh, recommended it is. Next slide. Uh, and, uh, and, and so there's a most benefit is at the lower EFs, that's still true, except for perhaps the SGLT. Uh, but MRA and diuretics and SGLT for sure, with the with ejection fraction greater than 50. When it's greater than 50, RNA, ACE, ARB, less clear. And then you see the weak sister over on the right beta blocker with uh, without even being bolded at all. And it's italicized. And that's because unless someone has angina or a prior myocardial infarction or atrial fibrillation and want to control the heart rate, there's really no reason to use a beta blocker. Next slide. Again, don't forget the treatment protocols. Uh, we want to improve functional status. We want to improve quality of life. We want to keep them out of the hospital. And so we treat the, their congestion with diuretics. We control concomitant issues, such as hypertension, especially also with atrial fibrillation, rate control. Don't forget the anticoagulation, of course. And revascularization is often something that you can consider. But now there are standard pharmacological therapies. Even though there's no total mortality reduction, there is a cardiovascular mortality reduction in addition to the hospitalization. Next slide. So my last slide, uh, treatment requires a holistic approach. It's a repeat of a lot of what you've seen earlier. Uh, we have a new standard of care. It's going to include an SGLT as well. Some of the referral patterns may change. I hope it didn't take too much time. And thanks for your attention. And that's it, uh, Sandy. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Appreciate that. Um, I didn't see any questions in the chat window. Um, so uh, are there any questions from this group? I mean, I guess, I guess my question really would be from the standpoint of um, PEF PEF, um, you know, in in what order are you starting things then? You're gonna start a diuretic, you're gonna start an SGLT2, and then you're gonna to go to an MRA. Is that kind of your direction? Um, yeah. from, from the standpoint of treatment, let's imagine. If they're hypertensive, I'll probably go with an ACE or ARB first. Uh, I don't go straight to an RNE because access is an issue. Um, and because if the EF is over 50, I'm not gonna really try with the, with the RNE anyway. And, and so I, uh, and if they're not that hypertensive, then I'll go with the MRA. Okay. Um, now I, I see that uh, Noel piped in here and said that um, um, at our at the amyloidosis event day last week, one of the speakers discussed the use of SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with cardiac amyloidosis, describing that they are well tolerated and anecdotal evidence suggesting a beneficial response and heart failure symptoms. I don't know if Jonathan, you've had any experience in that. And before you answer that, just a reminder that there is uh, sheets for uh, evaluations uh, as well as signing sheets uh, on the chat window. Yeah, I think Noel, you're you're probably talking about amyloid patients, I would guess. Yes. Um, and you've got a greater experience than I do, so I, I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to uh, interfere with uh, with that comment. It makes sense to me, certainly. Um, I bet most of the people here that see inpatients have, I know you have, Sandeep, have, uh, and it's routine on our heart flare service. We put them all on either in a clinical trial or we put them all on SGLTs when they're in hospital. And, and some of these patients have, they appear to have quite a, a significant response to them. Uh, Noel, you agree with that? Yeah, 
Yeah, it was an interesting comment. It was um, Matt Maurer, who is you know, probably one of the, the best uh, known uh, experts on cardiac amyloidosis uh, in the world right now. And uh, he's actually been putting all of his patients on them. Um, I've, you know, I've been asked that question a few times and I've kind of hedged and um, been a bit vague because I wasn't really sure the answer, um, but you know, he was showing actually a, a couple of patients who really benefited from it. And so I thought that was uh, very interesting. And you know, in, in hindsight, it, it makes sense. And you know, I've had, we've had a couple of patients arrive who've already been on them and they've seemed to be feeling quite fine. Um, but I, he says that he, he's actually putting them on them routinely now. Uh, which was quite interesting to hear. Uh, no, just to, along those lines. Uh, so for most patients with half path that are outpatients, the average EGFR is around 50. Uh, what would it be in your amyloid patients? Because if they have substantial renal disease, that, that's another indication for this. Yeah, that's a good question. And I, I couldn't tell you for certain. I don't think we've looked at that closely, it's probably close to that, um, maybe a bit less, um, you know, maybe in the mid 40s, uh, just guessing, but probably similar, you know, most of our patients, you know, when we when we meet them, their their renal function is relatively preserved unless we're finding them pretty late in their disease. Yeah, certainly if they have some renal disease, though, there, there, there could be some benefit from that perspective. I agree, Jonathan. Um, um, I'll ask you a different question, Jonathan, like, um, and I had this experience, and I don't know if you have, um, where I had a patient uh, who was on 10 of EMPA, and uh, they were still quite, you know, they were still in heart failure, and I actually increased their dose to 25, even though that's, that's not necessarily uh, how the clinical trials were run, and for heart failure, at least, and uh, that person had substantial benefit from that change from 10 to 25, and if you had that sort of uh, anecdotal experience with change in dosage. Of course, you wouldn't be doing that with APA because we're at the highest dose already. But with EMPA, you might. I, I've only done that a couple of times and it didn't, uh, I didn't see anything obvious. Was that person diabetic per perhaps? Uh, no, they weren't diabetic. Yeah. So I, no, I haven't, I haven't seen that. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, perhaps someone else on the call has. I've not seen that myself. I haven't, I've only done it a couple of times though. Right. And, and I, I just wonder, do you think that there's any reasons why that would make any differences between the clinical trials? Although they look very similar, there were some subtle differences between the clinical trials. Do you think dosage mattered? Yeah, I, it's hard to know. I mean, the, the, uh, it's, uh, the, there is a difference between 10 and 25 of AMPA in terms of um, any hyperglycemia, right? Um, so it's doing more and it may simply be that the dose of EMPA is, uh, is not the full dose, uh, that's been tested. Whereas the dose of EMPA was, uh, it could be that simple. Right. Okay. I tend to believe it has, that it exerts its effect through, uh, hydrostatic changes that occur as a result of, uh, the, of that, of that, um, a loss of solute from the nephron. That's that's what I think is happening. Whether it's cell uh, water turgor or whether it's a reduction in sympathetic stimulation from the kidney. A lot of people forget that the kidney is actually does have uh, significant sympathetic stimulatory activity. Um, others will say no, Jonathan. It's not like that at all. So I call it a fancy diuretic, even though it's not acting as a typical diuretic. Well, thank you. Are there any other questions from the group? Feel free to come off mute if you wish. A very shy group. Um, I see no more questions. So with that, I will thank uh, Dr. Howlett and Dr. Fine for uh, very good presentations. Um, and we will, this is recorded. We will have this uploaded to the Living Cardiovascular website. So thank you everybody for attending um, and uh, have a good night.